Harry's wife. South Park. Trashing old world values. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, continuing my examination of all matters through the lens of narcissism to ensure you understand so much about this important topic that permeates every aspect of the world around you. South Park mauled Harry's wife and Harry. It has meant that since then, she has been creeping around at private members' clubs, but not daring yet to go public as a consequence of the humiliation that was doled out. Indeed, the term worldwide privacy tour is utilised each time there is some suggestion that they might be making an appearance somewhere, as of course people have tuned into the hypocrisy of these two individuals. I have explained that their ship is very much sinking as a consequence of being holed below the line following the South Park episode. Not only did the episode in itself cause considerable challenges for Harry's wife by the provision of challenge fuel and all of the people that then thereafter commented on it across social media, it has also been widely commented upon across mainstream media and niche media. And now we turn to another view that demonstrates how Harry's wife is seen by journalists. Jeffrey A. Tucker writes in the Epoch Times, deeper meaning in South Park's ex-royal takedown. South Park's epic takedown of Harry and Harry's wife is a welcome relief after three years of the couple's insufferable exploits, during which these privileged two conspire with an adoring media to trash as many old world values as possible, while promoting every superficial cause. Superficiality, self-promotion, facade management, smearing. If there were a king and queen of the next new thing, and of craven ingratitude generally, they would qualify. To see the absurdity, you can freeze a frame out of almost any of their public appearances, such as in 2021, when they joined a star-studded Global Citizen Live campaign in New York to promote vaccine equity, whatever that is, as a means of ending the pandemic. Neither knows anything about the subject at all. I am quite certain they never followed the grim details of the vaccine trials, but of course it was the fashionable thing to do at the time, so they did it. This, of course, highlights the vacuous nature of Harry's wife, the fact that she's so empty, and that her narcissism guides her to jump on certain bandwagons without understanding what they truly are. Naturally, her narcissism isn't concerned about that. She's wafer-thin, empty on the inside. All it cares about is, is this a device that will enable this narcissist to gather fuel, control people, gain character traits and residual benefits? And if so, it will be commandeered and utilised. This is why you see so many things originating from narcissists and or being taken over by narcissists and used for our purposes. Indeed, certain things, for instance, the concept of love, was commandeered by narcissists so that genuine love became something called romantic love because romantic love is the manifestation of how we see love. And then, being those at the top of the tree with access to the creation of books and films and art and television programmes and greeting cards and so forth, we then set the narrative of what love is generally seen as. The sickening display of over-the-top love in inverted commas on Valentine's Day. So that is what the narcissist does. And here, as Tucker has identified, back in 2021, Harry's wife jumped on the bandwagon of this concept of vaccine equity as part of using it for the prime aims. He continues to write, don't expect either 
to show the slightest interest in those harmed by the vaccines, absence of emotion, empathy, much less the complete failure of the shot to live up to its promise. Millions experience job displacement and termination from failure to comply with job jab mandates, but they cannot be bothered. The plight of the peasants is of no interest to them, lack of accountability, sense of entitlement, absence of emotional empathy. Their only job is to be mouthpieces for whatever the ruling class tells them to say at the time, if only to keep viewership of their show and sales of their books as high as possible. Thanks to South Park, we get a more honest look. Here we have a man, born as third in line to the English throne, who followed a Hollywood airhead to his personal doom and family disgrace. Born to wealth and privilege, the rest of us cannot imagine. They parade as victims, victim mentality, on the world stage while trashing the dignity of family and tradition, smearing. It is a pathetic tale, but one certainly worthy of comedy, more than sympathy. The episode is called Worldwide Privacy Tour and features the Prince of Canada and his wife running from place to place demanding their privacy and right to live as normal people as loudly as possible. It's their only shtick and it only works so long as people do not comply with their demand for privacy. Their undoing comes when people stop caring, which does indeed seem to be happening, if we are to judge from the bins at Barnes and Noble. The episode opens with an earnest child who cannot stop mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth, even though it was four months ago. Here we have a picture of piety and respect. In the midst of this, what does the Prince of Canada do? Following his perfunctory appearance at the funeral, he releases his tell-all memoir, hilariously called Wah, and appears on late-night talk shows to promote its degrading message. The book tour takes them all over the world in their private jet, while campaigning against climate change, hypocrisy, and racism from which the wife is supposedly harmed in her relationship with the prince's family. When they finally settle down, they find that they have no raison d'etre, but for their tedious demand to be left alone, demonstrating the emptiness of Harry's wife, to which they insist everyone listen, sense of entitlement, grandiosity. Better yet, by the buck, it becomes obvious that privacy is the last thing they want, quite the opposite. They only build their bank accounts, residual benefit, by maximising the number of gawkers. The subplot of the episode is where we find the substantive import. There is a consultancy business in town that will give you a personal brand for a fee and train you how to use it. Locals are all lined up to hear the manager explain that it doesn't really matter what's on the inside of a person, not at all. People can only tell what drink you are drinking. And so a main character, Cal Brofsky, signs up for a brand, which consists of three descriptors followed by the word victim. The message here is that you cannot be anyone meaningful in the modern world without parading your plight, real or made up, to the public. This, of course, is a key element of woke ideology. Your main social and political obligation is to get back at the people who did you wrong and undo all of the structures of supposed oppression around you. Even princes can run this racket if they have the right consultants. After cycling through several brands, Kyle finally settles on one in which he is unflappable and bothered by anything that should come his way. When his across-the-street neighbours, the prince and his wife, try to rattle him with their incessant demands for privacy, he stops caring, which sends the couple into a deep funk of aimlessness. Essentially, he cuts off the fuel. The prince himself has a revelation that perhaps he should stop with the demands for privacy and normalcy and actually act to realise these ideas. His wife is utterly puzzled by the suggestion, which, of course, is entirely accurate as how she, as a narcissist, would respond to such a suggestion. It makes no sense to her because demanding but not getting sums up the whole of her existence. Indeed, he lifts up her head and yells inside, only to hear his own voice echo back. Exhausted and confused, the prince finally walks out the door. The South Park kids decided to let go of their whole attachment to brands, in addition to their gaming addictions and online malarkey, and instead play a nice game of basketball. The prince asked to join them, thus the ending message. Let go of the fakery and digital commodification of the human personality, and instead embrace friendship, love, and mercy as the desiderata of the good life. That indeed is a very powerful and much-needed message. As for the real-life Harry... The part of his plight that is truly heartbreaking concerns the commodification of himself 
at the expense of his family and destiny, collateral consequence of his ensnarement with the narcissist. It would be one thing for him to give up his royal status to become a high school teacher, a frontline fast food worker, or some other respectable profession. But to merely become an influencer is beneath the dignity of his birth. To masquerade as a victim is truly over the top. We used to speak of limousine liberals and champagne socialists, but Harry and Harry's wife embody something far more extreme and absurd. It's privilege that is truly invisible to its holders, one that allows them to live the highest of lives while woefully neglecting the actual victims of the causes they back. They tell the rest of the world to power their homes and cars from sunbeams and breezes while they burn up the fossil fuels on worldwide influencer tours and Netflix specials. They will be the last people to eat bugs, that's for sure. The South Park episode might indeed serve as a turning point on this whole cultural meme, one can hope so. Harry's wife and Harry reportedly found the episode disturbing, but then walked that back by saying they were not considering a lawsuit. A spokesperson said that such speculation was boring, and in their world there is no worse a moniker of anything. Sadly for them, boring is precisely where they are headed. I would suggest that they reached that destination many moons ago. We know that Harry's wife is Duchess of Industrial Beige, and Harry, once interesting, has become increasingly dull as a consequence of his invasion of personality by his wife. This piece in the Epoch Times again sums up the view that is formed of Harry and Harry's wife and demonstrates just the contempt that is now held for them and how the South Park episode, as, as I mentioned earlier, very much hold the SS Sussex below the line. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.